Hey, how's it going? My name is Action, and this is Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door. It's a beloved game from my childhood, so naturally it made me very excited to hear about the remake announced this year. So I wanted to play through it again, but with a little added challenge. Can you beat Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door if all enemies have double attack? What? What do you mean that's too easy? Super guard prevents all damage? Okay, fine, I'll disable that too. Still too easy? Okay, what if a regular guard costs 20 star power? Still too easy. Okay, okay, then how about I double FP costs and enforce a cap of 30 FP? No? Really? Come on, dude. Alright then, for every chapter after prologue, I'll spin a wheel that adds an extra restriction for that chapter. Certainly that's hard enough for you, right? I've put the eight restrictions on screen, go ahead and read them. For the sake of transparency, I did all of the spins at once so I could vet each to ensure the chapter would be clearable with it in effect. I'd hate to have an impossible challenge, after all. By the way, the graphics look a bit crusty because I couldn't be bothered to install the HD pack. I realized I didn't do this most of the way through recording. You want good graphics? Buy the remake. Support the game so they make more good Paper Mario. But anyway, with the rules in place, let's get into the prologue. As the game's title implies, you are Mario and you are made of paper. This might be important later. Princess Peach finds a magical treasure map while on vacation in some slum called Rogueport and thought it'd be a good idea to mail it to Mario. Driven by the call of treasure and princesses, he hires a boat across the sea without a second thought. The man's on land less than a minute and somehow gets involved in a gang war against Lord Rump and his clowns. Are you sure this is worth it, Mario? It can't be that bad at home with Luigi, right? Since guarding costs star power, it's impossible for now. But this fight isn't because it doesn't make a difference and I walk all over his cake. Goombella joins us and we're off to find Professor Frankly who asks us to travel through the sewers to investigate the treasure map. The wall down there, Mario proves he lacks common sense by opening a talking box that curses him, giving him the first of four paper powers that let him traverse the world. Eh, yeah, good to hear he won't be relying on his partners for everything. We arrive at the titular Thousand Year Door, show it the map, and it shows us where the first of seven crystal stars can be found. A large castle in Petal Meadows to the east. We pick up some badges from the locals and head out. But just before the pipe to Petal Meadows, Mario finds a soggy tentacle. Now Mario's watched enough anime to know that he should probably smash it. Mario learns his actions have consequences because, surprise, it's Big Blooper, the boss of the prologue. However, he's no trouble as a fire flower knocks him down long enough for Mario and Goombella to smash his brains in and we continue onward to bigger challenges. The wheel has been spun, and it's landed on plus two enemy defense. This is awful. I have very few ways to actually deal damage to anything now. Even these little Goombas can tank most things Mario can throw out. If I spend FP, I can defeat them with a badge or use an item. But coins are really limited right now, so paying to heal or buying more items is kind of out of the question. So of course, I choose to avoid most fights since items will often be the best way for me to deal spread damage, or any damage at all in this chapter, I'll need to use them wisely to make it through. We arrive in Petalburg, home to iconic Mario characters like Bub Olb, White Bob Om, and Disco Clown. Old ass Koopa with glorious eyebrows tells us the local dragon has the crystal star and we'll need to murder her to get it, but we'll need the stone keys first. Mario gets permission from the mayor to go get the stone keys despite Gumbella making herself at home and digging for coins in his couch. Please don't embarrass me like that again, dude. After an awkward introduction with Cooper, we dodge encounters with the exception of four that serve as item tutorials. You got pow blocks for the clefts and bristles, and fire flowers for the fuzzies after each stone. With the keystones in hand, we head out to Hooktail's castle, but Cooper won't let us leave town unless we take him away from his clingy girlfriend for a while. He's just a Koopa, but he's got a slick hoodie, so I guess we'll bring him along. So it's at this point I realize I'm gonna need a ton of fire flowers if I have any chance to clear the dungeon, as I'll need to squeeze the life out of them to deal any damage. Problem is, I don't have any fucking money. 
Gumbella's a college student, so she doesn't have any, and Cooper's girlfriend would never approve the purchase of flowers for a different girl, so Mario's gonna have to sell drugs. In Petal Meadows, there's this little guy here, and if you smash his head ten times, a mushroom-looking thing pops out. If I take it back to Rogueport, I can sell it for two coins. So if I mathed this right, I'll only need to smash the little guy 400 times, haul them to Rogueport so I can buy an entire bouquet of fire flowers for Hooktail. Oh man, I love grinding, so fun. We get the job done and keep a few stowed away for later use. There are only two required fights in Hooktail's castle. The first is Red Bones and his boner buddies. We used two fire flowers, but we could have saved one with a piercing blow. Easy stuff, moving on. Mario continues failing upwards by getting cursed by another talking box. This time, he can turn sideways. Probably should have been able to do that already, but whatever. We use it to grab the sound effects badge and move on. We keep climbing and arrive at the tallest tower where we're met with a giant fucking dragon that's going to eat Mario and Cooper. Hooktail, the aforementioned fucking dragon, hates the sound effects badge we picked up and it lowers attack and defense by one each time it makes noise. So Mario becomes a living noisemaker and Cooper starts throwing fire flowers in her face. The attack drops are enough to buy us time to defeat phase one. Desperate, Hooktail offers Mario coins and badges in exchange for sparing her life. He says no because he has a treasure to save or something but he can't resist the alluring offer of sniffing a dragon's foot. This opportunity could never come up again, and he just has to know. She eats Mario, and then the audience to recover some HP. Yeah, I'm sure they're fine, just keep fighting. Three more flowers and a smash to her toes later, and the mighty fucking dragon has been defeated. The first crystal star is ours after a touching family reunion with Cooper's dad. It teaches us Earth Tremor, which is a good special for causing a lot of AoE damage. Yeah, I might use it a few times. Meanwhile, Peach gets captured, talks with the computer to send Mario an email, and Bowser's planning a picnic or something. I don't know. We grab Mega Rush P, a top tier badge that increases our partner's attack by 5 when they have 1 HP. Leave the princess on red and head back to show the door of the star, get our map updated. The next star is in the Bogley Woods. Old Prof Frank tells us how to get there and we head out. But before we do, we stop and have a chat with Luigi and upgrade Gumbella to Super Rank. This unlocks Multibonk, which will be very useful for many upcoming encounters. Multibonk lets Gumbella bonk multiple times. Mm hmm. Name checks out. Boss enemies have random caps to prevent Gumbella from bonking them down in one turn. Back in the sewers, Mario asserts his dominance by bullying this little squishy thing named Punio into opening the way to Bogley Woods. Goombella pretends not to be impressed and we follow Punio into Chapter 2. According to UA Local 1 Plumbers Union, Mario is entitled to an hour-long break every shift and he's decided to take it now. That means Mario won't be allowed to take any actions besides the defend a tactic for the entire chapter. This will cause trouble, so be ready for when it causes trouble. Since Mario's on break, he ignores the domestic abuse that's happening in the middle of the forest, saves the sleepy sheep from the tree, and tries to find the break room. Though I think he'll be walking around for his entire break. Without Mario's help, the encounters are still too resource heavy to clear as most enemies are spiked or shift positions to make them immune to his partner's attacks. Watch as I sit and think on this encounter, trying to figure out if it's worth it without item investment. Yeah, I'll be running away a lot again. The clown gang from Prologue have taken over the great tree and we need Madame Fleury's help to break in. But she's lost her necklace and simply can't be seen without it. Conveniently enough, the domestic abuse victim found this necklace, so we'll need to take it back from her by force. The Shadow Sirens are a pain in Mario's ass, and there's three of them, each with a regular attack and a special attack, plus a sizable total HP compared to our damage. Stunning them is a priority, and it can be done with items. The Sleepy Sheep or an Ice Storm has a chance to stun. From there, Multibonk can put on tons of damage, assuming I actually succeed the action command and don't get capped. 
it takes a few tries for me to beat this one because of my own mistakes. Missed action commands and failed stuns, letting them use all their special attacks at once. Eventually I stop being bad, equip HP+, plus, and take them out. And my man Luigi even tossed me some maple syrup. <laughs> what a guy. Now that Madame Fleury is finally decent, she accompanies us back to the Great Tree to uncover the secret entrance for us. But that's not all this large cloud woman can do, because she's going to blow all of our enemies away. Inside the Great Tree, we gain the trust of punies to help us solve puzzles and progress. The insides of this Great Tree hurt my eyes, so I try to get through without incident. We go shopping, gather punies, gather them again because they'd rather jump off a bridge than be near a spider, and solve a puzzle to get a new pair of boots that'll power up Mario's jumps. Very cool, can't wait to use those next chapter. Todd's sister shows us how to do a spin jump and we continue to the bottom where the crystal star rests. Through the power of punies, the crystal star appears and Lord Dump swipes it and activates his remote time bomb. Man's gonna blow up a tree to get what he wants. You know, I won't lie, I respect it. We abandon the punies and rush to take it back only for Lord Dump to call his giant mech. You know, if he had pulled this thing out in Rogueport, Mario would be a pancake by now and there'd be no opposition. I can only imagine Magnus von Grapple's state-of-the-art mech technology because he can launch badass rocket fists. And these fists need to be taken care of before they can punch an 8 damage hole in Mario's chest. So once again, items and multi bonks are the best way to send Magnus back to the scrap heap. Even after missing the action command once, the items are too strong and Mario wins despite doing nothing but spending his entire paycheck on power punch and ice storms. With the clowns gone, the crystal star is ours. We say our goodbyes and leave as Mario's break is over. We learn clock out to let us stun enemies so long as we mash the right button and get lucky. Meanwhile, Peach dances with herself to please the computer, and Bowser becomes the huge mighty king of guys who talk to posters. Mario leaves the princess on red again and returns to Rogueport to unlock the next chapter. Old Prof Frank tells us it's at the Glitz Pit, a huge wrestling ring a mile up in the sky. Mario's fear of heights grips him so hard his idle animation turns off so Flurry has to figure out how to get us there. We'll need a blimp ticket, and since we still don't have money, the only way to get one is by doing a favor for a crime syndicate boss. First gang wars, now mobsters. This treasure better be worth it, Princess. On the west side of town, we break into the mob boss's office after telling the shop girl downstairs our mustache is yellow. She's so impressed by our bold lie, she unlocks the door for us. Ugh, it's like a soap opera in here but we're tasked with finding the Don's daughter and bringing her back in exchange for the ticket. Now, Mario and I have played this game before, so we find her in a matter of seconds and head out on the very safe airship. Hold my hand, Mario. It's gonna be okay. The wheel has spoken, and it says no star power. Now, not being able to use star power may not sound like a big deal because I haven't used any specials so far. Now remember the blocking costs star power, so no blocking for a while. Yeah, I'm sure it'll be fine. So hopefully Grubba won't ask me to use a special move when it matters. We land in Glitzville and head inside. Rockhawk pulls out his belt and what do you know, it has the crystal star glued on it. So the only logical thing to do is become a professional wrestler and take the title from him. We plunge into the minor leagues as the Great Gonzales and start the sweaty grind to the top. Most of the early fights are easy to mop up despite mine and Grubba's conditions. Grubba will add extra rules to pump up the crowd, like appeal to them, don't jump, or let the enemy pummel you three times. That last one sucks as enemies still have double attack and Mario's made of paper, literally and figuratively. So things go as expected, and as we progress, we hear about hot dogs with egg on them and rush outside to grab a dozen. Out of the way, Cock Hawk, it's hot dog time. This egg is alive, so we take it and have it watch us fight for sport. Also, it kind of messed up that a pig is selling hot dogs in the first place, but eh, what can you do? The first interesting fight is against the armored harriers. These guys are total chads, complete with three foot iron chins. Can't hurt them. 
Don't even try it. Run like a coward baby. However, Egg sees this and abandons us. <laughs> Just kidding. He hatches and is Yoshi. I name him Clam because he's going to slam his ass all over the competition. He's a fast little man, so I'll be riding him a lot as the game goes on. Clam swallows the walking chin's hole and we move on to the major leagues. Haha, <laughs> just kidding again, it isn't that easy. Grubba wants me to let these chads hit me three times to really get the crowd on their feet. Their attacks pierce defense and I can't block, so HP plus is the answer and pretty lucky is a mistake. Not really a big deal, it's just kind of funny how many times Mario embarrasses them. A few hot dogs later and now we're in the majors. If I cover every fight, this is gonna take forever. Just know that many fights become much harder if I can't just earth tremor them down. So some more fights and some mysterious emails later, it's time for the championship match against Rock Cock. But first, Todd's sister shows us the super hammer for plus two hammer damage and a spin attack I barely use. Thanks, Todd's sister. We jump into the ring against Mr. Hawk and he's a master of acrobatics because he has a bunch of crazy aerial maneuvers. But none of that matters because Power Punch and Multi Bonk is the strat again. <laughs> yeah, I bet you didn't see that one coming. He hits pretty hard, but we can out damage him thanks to some pretty lucky bullshit. But this man jumps up to the ceiling and drops junk on us and makes me use Flurry to get him down. Mmm, time to die, champ. The Great Gonzalez is the new champ and everything is great. Except it's not because Macho Man Grubba Savage uses the power of Slim Jims and the Crystal Star to get huge. You'll never guess the strat this time. Oh, yeah. That's right, it's Power Punch Multibunk. Such variety, you love to see it. Macho Man can snap into a Slim Jim and buff himself up. Yeah, you know, extra turns, extra attack, dodgy. Yeah, that's great. My repel cape makes me dodgy too, so suck it. From there, I set myself up for a point swap. Yeah, you got this thing that's called a point swap. It just, it, it swaps points. Heart points, flower points, just, just fucking switch them. So that, in combination with power and mega rush badges, this last multi bonk is gonna crush Grubba into dust. Unjustifiably in a position that I'd rather not be in. We ignore the wholesome reunion again and bounce after learning power lift which will up our attack and defense for a few turns. Meanwhile, Peach plays dress-up for the computer's amusement, and Bowser watches two old hags fight. I got 20 bucks on Cammy, who's in? Back in Roadport, the magic map points us to Twilight Town to the west, a dank, dark pit of gloomy dullness that make anyone who lived there depressed as all hell. The wheel spins once again and it lands on Poison Party. Now before we arrive, let me apologize for the lack of difficulty that this restriction will provide. Yeah, on paper I thought it'd be cool, but it ended up being underwhelming and not working properly with Mario losing and gaining partners throughout the chapter. All it really does is further incentivize me to avoid all encounters on Twilight Trail. Anyway, I, I could have picked a new one, but it's my challenge, get over it. Here in Twilight Town, a magic curse is bending over these poor peasants and turning them into pigs each time the steeple bell rings. The obvious solution is a massive barbecue, but the mayor doesn't like this idea. So it's our job to lift the curse, and the eminent backtracking makes Mario's idle animation turn off again. If you didn't know, this chapter is infamous for having tons of backtracking even if you know what to do. But before we get into it, Mario falls with the same talking box trick again and becomes Tube. Tube provides good movement and lets him roll under stuff, so I'll be tubing around when I can. We walk along the twilight trail, run from the Amazy Daisy, and get to the steeple. Inside, we grab the cookbook and fight the optional atomic boo fight for fun. No big deal, just don't get immobilized like I did the first time, and it's doable with spin jumps and multi bonks. But yeah, it's here I find out that Mario's power bounce costs 10 FP for some reason, and that's why you'll never see it used. A bit later, Mario becomes purple after an easy fight against a bedsheet watching TV. Yeah, just hit him a bunch, spin jumps, clam slams, no problem. Walk back to Twilight Town, help Vivian find a grenade. Walk back to Creepy Steeple, get a giant pea and spook a parrot. Walk back to Twilight Town and say the bedsheet's real name. Walk back to Creepy Steeple for another fight. It's the same fight, but now Mario's partners are on the other side. Vivian bails when she realizes who we are, but comes back like a turn later, so whatever. All this really does is mess up the poison party slot so she won't be poisoned for the fight. Ah, oh, fuck. 
Challenge is ruined. Spin jumps and power rush help deal damage, and Shade Fist's burn deals consistent damage while Viv is busy feeding super shrooms to Mario. And we take back the crystal star, and Dupless jumps off the steeple, likely not surviving the fall. Certainly won't see him again, that's for sure. We learn Art Attack, a move that will aid us greatly in the future as a reliable source of AoE damage. Meanwhile, Peach is given a pop quiz, and Bowser goes for a brisk swim, then swallows a blooper. Yeah, after how they've hurt Mario's feelings, they'll be lucky if we ever come back. But you know the drill. We head back to Rogueport, leave the princess on red, and get our map updated. And we give Zesty the cookbook we found in Creepy Steeple, and we have her cook us up a couple of Zest dinners with the mushrooms we stowed away earlier. Now the treasure map points towards Keel Hall Key to the south. A wonderful tropical paradise with treasures aplenty guarded by a pirate king. So naturally, the only way to get there is to drum up a pirate crew of our own. First, we'll need a boat. And apparently the only one with a boat is this guy. Isn't this a port? How is this the only boat? Alright, I guess Flavio is in the crew as the guy with a boat. Next is a navigator, and the perfect guy happens to live in town. But he's depressed or something, I don't know. So we break into his house and blackmail him into helping us. Is that what actually happened? Mm hmm. Play the remake, find out. With Admiral Bob with us, we can set sail for Keel Hall Key. Nothing but Flavio's frilly tales of frilly adventure to pass the time. Oh my god, make it stop. My prayers are answered, and the ship is attacked by fiery spirits and the crew washes ashore. This chapter's restriction is no items. Very straightforward. Can't use any items except for those that would progress the story for obvious reasons. Besides those, I'm disgusted by items. So much so that I crushed this poor toad's head in for offering me a mushroom. Yeah, you'll think twice before you do that again, mister. You know, this place kind of reminds me of a Donkey Kong level. I'm kind of expecting an... ...to celebrate my successes. However, I probably won't succeed given how low level I am, so we grind on the local wildlife, reaching the FP cap of 30. Peril Cooper sure gets the job done. So, with Mario's puzzle-solving skills and Bobbery's ability to blow himself up, gets us inside the pirate's grotto. Mario finds the final black box, but we all know how it goes by now. It fools us good, and we can become boat. Yeah, that, that's great. Now, how about we sail home now? What was that? Princess? Treasure? Okay, fine. We'll keep boating onward. After a bit more boating, we find the treasure. Gold coins, gems, and jewelry everywhere, but the Spanish skeleton says we can't have it. Come on, man, I just want the crystal star. Help me out here. Cortez the Pirate King has 20 HP, 8 attack, 1 defense, 4 arms, 3 phases, and a crap ton of treasure. Phase 1, a soft stomp badge, takes care of his defenses, so Mario and Goombella can squish his skull in. Phase 2 is the same, but with less arms, make him soft and squish him. But in Phase 3, Cortez and his weapons just float there. Menacingly. Flurry gets to be useful here because her Gale Force will permanently remove the weapons from the fight, which will cripple his damage output. In the first attempt, Cortez just focuses Mario down. Without items, Sweet Tree is my only source of healing and it's just not good enough. But second time around, he spreads out his attacks and I get a few lucky dodges. It's at this point I remember about Art Attack. Yeah, you remember Art Attack? It's pretty good, you should probably use it. It brings him low, but of course it causes him to eat the souls of my audience fully healing him. Now that's a cool move, I wish I could do that one. But despite being the second boss that eats my audience, he goes down after some more squishing. He's already dead, so we can't actually kill him. So he just hands over the crystal star and we learn Sweet Feast, an improved sweet treat. Yeah, that would have been nice to have two minutes ago. Yeah, well, whatever. So now we have to figure out how to get home. Mario's just a little baby boat, so he couldn't possibly take everyone home. Eh, Cortez gave us treasure. Maybe he'll let us borrow his boat, too. 
eager to be out on the seas again, we set sail, but of course Lord Thrump has to take a shot at us Black Flag style. Does he crush me to death with his fat ass? Bad question. You're not looking at the big picture here. Do I try again, use power lift, and make him spawn more adds instead of attacking? Now that's more like it. We almost die again, but we didn't, so take that, Frumpy. He retreats and lets us sail back to Rogueport unharmed. Meanwhile, Peach gets naked after drinking a strange substance and Bowser blows up Twilight Town. Good job, man. I'm proud of you. The map whispers to me that the next stop is Poshley Heights, a terrible pit where all the richest people are kept, only accessible by a three-day trip on the fanciest train known to man. Problem is, Mario still doesn't have any fucking money for a ticket, so he's got to do another favor for Don Pianta, the soap opera star. His daughter hasn't come home yet, so we need to go find her again. Take it easy, dude. Your kid's been gone for like a week on her honeymoon. She'll come visit soon. While on our little fetch quest, we meet Wacka on Keelhaw Key and smash his head in for six Wacka Bumps, a fantastic limited healing item for 25 HP and FP. Anyway, we bring the Don's daughter back and we have our ticket. But before we board, we grab the double dip badge, recruit the badge shop Floozy, and upgrade our partners to ultra rank. Except for Flurry. We're not going to use Flurry. Here in Chapter 6, the wheel lands on two times enemy HP. Now, there's not many encounters here, but it should make the boss more interesting at the very least. Now, Chapter 6 is actually a ton of fun the first time around. Big detective movie, and I won't spoil much of it. The train stops at Riverside Station to refuel, and Mario's asked to head inside to grab some snacks and maybe sweep up a little bit. There are no snacks, but there is a pair of Ultra Boots upping Mario's attack again, and Todd's sister shows us the Spring Jump, which will be a high damage option moving forward, and I'll be relying on it a lot. Would you believe me if I said I'm still pretty low level, and that I grind on the enemies a little bit to get my HP up? I even go for the 200 IQ play to set up peril strats, only to completely forget about the forced full heal to end each day. Eh, it would have made the boss too easy anyway. And speaking of bosses, we have Smorg, and it's kidnapped the passengers and threatens to blow up the train. Thanks to the wheel, Smorg has 100 HP, and while its tentacles are out, it cannot be damaged directly until they're defeated. So you remember that double dip badge I picked up earlier? You should, that was like two minutes ago. It's going to make this fight doable by letting us double dip thunder rages to open it up for multi bonks and spring jumps. Rinse and repeat until phase two, where the big pincher comes out and chunks 40 damage across both my guys. But that's okay, because it sets Mario up for a boosted spin jump. From there, a point swap set up the party to finish him off. The train is saved and we arrive at Poshley Heights safely. Uh, you know, it's been a long trip, and Mario just wants to sit back with some booze. This is not what I meant. Anyway, we take this L, grab the crystal star, and leave. It teaches a showstopper, a move I don't even consider using once because it almost never works on bosses. Though it would be cool to reset for a boss kill, I'm not doing that. Meanwhile, Peach hangs out with Grotus, and Bowser does a sweaty workout with Rock Hawk. Back in Rogueport, we get the Ultra Hammer, and Todd's sister shows us the spin attack again. I I've seen this before, but thank you, very cool. Maybe I'll use it this time? We'll see. Chapter 7 is here, and the wheel says my partners are dead and murders them on the spot and it would take the greatest of miracles to bring them back. This is going to be much harder than the No Mario challenge, as I no longer have them available as meat shields. I used a little bit of coding to help me set their HP to zero on a zero, but it's fine because the team is babies. Old Prof Frank and the map say the crystal star is on the moon. The fuck? How are we going to get to the moon? Oh right, I've played this game before. But since Don Pianta's spaceship is in the shop for repairs, we'll need to use the gigantic cannon these Tundra Bombs have just chilling at Far Outpost. 
But we can't just use it for free. Nah, that'd be too easy, and this is a challenge run. I'll need to find General White and Gold Bob before we can use the cannon. You know, red tape, paperwork, all that fun stuff. Finding General White is a wild goose chase across the entire map that annoyed the crap out of me even after I googled where to go. And Gold Bob just takes all my money. But we're off to the moon. Yeah, it looks safe. Everyone hop in. We somehow survive the blast and start grinding on the moon chads because Mario needs a ton of HP level ups moving forward. Yeah, the Ultra Spin put in a ton of work here. Thanks, Dot Sister. Really came in clutch. Appreciate it. After an undisclosed amount of grinding, I arrive in the x naught Fortress. I can only imagine the astronomical costs of building an entire supercomputer and a base around it on the moon. Like, where is Grotus getting the money for this shit? Anyway, there's elevators, electric tile puzzles from the future, and background platforming, and a bunch of enemies that threaten to beat up Mario and take his lunch money like a bunch of bullies. Luckily, Mario's not a little kid and he can fight back with heart attack clock out and jump power badges. I've really been glossing over these dungeons because I'm not really here to show you the solutions, they're just how I'm tackling these required fights. But speaking of required fights, look over there. It's Magnus Von Grapple 2.0. He's back from the repair shop with a new coat of paint and a ton more attack power. He's still got those badass rocket fists, only now they have huge spikes on the front. And once again, if they're not taken care of, these X-Fists are going to X-Fist Mario's ass. But halfway through the fight, he pulls his cock out and sucks my audience out of their seats and blasts me for like 6,000 damage. There's no way for me to survive this attack, so good thing I got life shrooms, huh? I also end up relying on lucky dodges and even an HP bingo. But I don't really feel bad about this. You shouldn't either. Lord Chump makes like Team Rocket and blasts off again and the final crystal star is mine. It teaches us Supernova, but I'll never use it because it costs 600 star power and that's like all my star power. I need that, dude. Meanwhile, Bowser breaks into the Poshly Sanctum and gets his first crystal star. Oh shit, he's catching up. I better get moving. We take the teleporter back to Rogueport. How convenient. And yeah, old Prof Frank meets us there in the sewers and urges us to open the thousand year door. Our little wheel spins one last time and the only thing left is no badges. On its own, that's not really a problem. However, that uh, coding I used to set my uh, partner's HPs to zero, it kept their HP at zero even after I turned it off. So I guess I'm doing chapter eight with dead partners and no badges. Uh, the Palace of Shadows is a huge dungeon filled with tons of enemies that respawn every time I leave. And can you guess how many times I need to leave? Six required battles await me, each one capable of dealing tons of damage to Mario and requiring a carefully thought out and expensive plan. Hey, it's a good thing I got all these useless badges to sell because I'm going to need a few thousand coins to even think about winning. First up is Dark Bones and his boner buddies. Yeah, I made that joke earlier. Get over it, it's my video. This fight isn't too hard if I just use Art Attack, but I do not just use Art Attack. I rely on Ice Storm Freezes, Ultra Spin, and Clock Out like a dumbass and get lucky. But that's the least of my worries, because up next is Gloomtail, and he's pissed that we killed his sister. He's another fucking dragon capable of slapping my ass cheeks for a minimum 16 damage, adding new attacks as he gets damaged. Stomps, bites, breaths, earthquakes, mega breaths. This dude's got it all, and I wish I had a fraction of his power. So the plan is to land all my spring jumps while cramming ultra shrooms down Mario's throat to keep him alive. It's a pretty good plan that relies pretty heavily on me landing my spring jumps, but it only takes like three tries to work, so hey, I'll take it. Yeah, and these spring jumps take varying amounts of time for Mario to get his fat ass over to the target, so can you really blame me for fucking it up a few times? I mean, you could, but like, don't be a dick, dude, alright? But this means I'm all out of items, and now I have to run all the way out to gather more for the next battle. But good news, Zesty cooks for fun or something, so I spend all my coins on the finest syrups, jellies, and mushrooms, and make her cook it all for free. No payments, no tips, no nothing. 
Look, she's just happy to have company, okay? Now I have Ultra Shrooms covered in syrup and jelly for that sweet, sweet FP recovery. I ride on Clam all the way back to the next fight, but don't worry about it. It only takes like five minutes each way, no big deal. Just stop, stop worrying about it. Up next is Beldum and Marilyn, and they've gathered the seven Dragon Balls and wished Dupless back to life after his unfortunate fall from Creepy Steeple. It's just like last time, but they're stronger. And just like last time, I need to fish for a stun or freeze to not get disintegrated in two turns. Clockout's got a 50% chance to stun here, so it doesn't take long to get two of them stunned. Beldum can buff her side and slow Mario and take away his turns. I don't think I need to say this, but it's pretty much over if this happens, so burning her down before she can do it gives me the best chance of winning. Spring jumps, art attacks, boo sheets, maple ultras are enough to make it through after just a few tries. And guess what time it is? That's right, it's time to walk all the way out and back in again to gather the necessary items. Oh boy, that's my favorite part. Oh yeah, a little side note for the next fight. Sometimes the textures would glitch out and I thought it was pretty funny this time. Rotus blocks our path and he comes packing a moveset that any Pokemon would want. Thunderbolt, flamethrower, ice beam, and a bunch of status moves including an evasion boost. Each turn, this clown makes two Grotus X that provide him with an extra defense. With four up, he's invincible and you can't hurt him. Stop hiding in your bubble, big man. Come and fight me. And without partners and badges, Mario has very few AoE attacks on his own, the only relevant ones being art attack and items. So that's the plan. Use shooting stars to break the X's and art attacks for bigger damage while not blocking to have enough star power to use it twice. This fight is horribly RNG dependent. And if I get stunned or frozen, it's just over. And if he dodges too many shooting stars or if I have to heal too much, he becomes invincible and I just don't have the items to cover it. So you guessed it, it's over. So I bring in two Maple Ultras, two Jelly Ultras, and six shooting stars with good RNG, and that's it. I win. It's time to move on. But wait, we can't move on because Bowser crashes his fat ass through the ceiling and demands a fight before we can leave to get more items. Hey, it's a good thing I set my star points up to level up after Grotus so I can have full star power and a little extra HP. Bowser's here and he's pissed too. What's a finale without a Bowser appearance, huh? A cruddy one, that's what. He's had a real bad day and he's gonna take it out on Mario. His attacks can lock Mario out of his abilities. While well, not exactly an instant wipe, I do have to steer and adapt if it happens. He's brought along Kami Koopa. You know, the old hag from earlier that I lost 20 bucks on. Her primary role here is to annoy the hell out of me and I want her to know that I hate her. Luckily I can do this by focusing all of my attacks on her after getting a clock out stun. Once she goes down, it's just a matter of out healing Bowser's damage and landing spring jumps. Oh yeah, one thing I haven't mentioned yet is stage RNG. As you level up, more layers of RNG get added from falling objects to fog to ice and fire blasts. Take a look at this very winnable attempt that got ruined by three consecutive fire blasts it, that add it, up to it, just it. enough to kill Mario. This doesn't happen the next attempt and the stage RNG actually helps me as I land one final spring jump to end Bowser once and for all. Somehow Grotus survived Bowser's fat ass and runs off with the princess to summon the final battle. Shadow Queen has returned and possessed Peach's body making her a dark and edgy goth girl. She has a massive HP pool, hits like a truck, and has a ton of attacks and statuses for herself and Mario. But halfway through, she just transforms into her final form and is invincible. No damage. Can't hurt her. Really should have submitted when I had the chance. Did the crystal stars see the writing on the wall and bail on Mario to gather the affirmations of the friends we've made along the way? It is only after the power of cutscenes and plot armor that Mario can actually hurt this demon, but I'll be honest, it's still not enough. In this form, the Shadow Queen gains an infinite supply of hands and she's ready to throw them. And that's where the problem lies. The big hands are likely to attack with a life drain to heal her for the same damage dealt. Meaning that she can heal up to 28 damage per turn. And guess what? I can't deal more than 28 damage per turn. So I guess items get to bail my ass out once again. Shooting stars can take out the hands and ship the queen, but 
both hands come back each turn. Wow, what a good plan. So what happens when you need to heal? Uh, the hands come back and reverse up the last four and a half stars used in one turn. Fuck, this is impossible. Alright, alright, all it's, it's fine, calm down. What if, what if there's a way to carry more items? There is? Cool, how do I get it? Only like 45 consecutive battles in some pit? Yeah, I can do that. And that's what I do to acquire a strange sack. I cram my sack full of shooting stars, blue sheets, and 2,000 coins worth of recovery items. But uh, this still isn't possible because I would need 25 shooting stars to deal 150 damage, but don't you worry about that. Let me worry about that. It's time to try again. And phase 1 goes as expected. Spring jumps and heart attacks, you know, you know the drill. But this time, the power of cutscenes is so strong and everyone's shouts and cheers are that much louder. It brings old Cooper back to life, and now he can sponge damage and throw stars for me. Turns out all Mario needed was the power of teamwork and a ton of coins for items. Thoughtful use of said items lets the fight progress as normal despite many, many missed spring jumps. I'm good at this game, I promise. Look, we even get to see the rare allergic status that just doesn't let us gain new status effects for its duration. With all my shooting stars and blue sheets used up, one last art attack smites the demon back to her grave and the day is saved. We go home and tell Luigi all about it. He pretends to care about our story because we never actually listened to his. Now before you say anything, I'll say that I wish I didn't have to pull off that little stunt and do it with just Mario. But I didn't see a way to get it done and since I never intended to do this chapter without partners, I think it's a fair trade-off. If you made it this far, I, I want to say thank you for being here. This was just a project I did in my spare time to try something new. Yeah, it turns out being bored will do that to a guy. Uh, but please, let me know what you thought of this. It took me about three months to get this done, and any feedback would be cool to see. As it turns out, it's really hard to balance video creation with your full-time job and your family and your recent addiction to Final Fantasy XIV. But before I go, if you liked your time with me today, I'd appreciate it if you dropped a like and a sub and all those other things that YouTubers usually beg for. Uh, guys, did you know that 99.5% of my viewers are subscribed to the channel? These are rookie numbers and we need to get that way lower so I have a right to complain about it. Anyway, thanks a lot and maybe I'll see you again. Peace.